August 15, 1953. Shortly before midnight in Tehran, Iran's capital city, the air was thick with anticipation. Something big was about to happen. The elected prime minister of Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh, was sitting at home, waiting. He knew something was coming. Submitted to allegedly the largest pirate radio station in the world. I don't know if they actually played it or not. I probably should have been more on the ball with my branding. No, just kidding. It's a thank you very much for Kelly for submitting it to the person who ran it. I'd still love to hear if they actually played it and if they're interested in playing more, of course. I'm always interested to know if there are other places that I can broadcast from. Uh, this week I've been doing a little bit of research into that. And it seems like there's more peer tube instances available than the last time I looked. But unfortunately, I was not able to get any of them to work. The one that I tried was down when I tried. But it is promising, at least, that as time goes on, we're seeing more and more different groups with the capacity to compete with YouTube, the giant Google alphabet a monster that is capable of providing video for free for the world, at least free if you allow them to spy on your listeners and watchers. But it is getting better. The technology is improving. Uh, federated video is becoming a possibility, but unfortunately it didn't work for me personally this week, although it is working for others. What else is going on this week? I do want to mention, as the clip in the uh, beginning kind of pointed out that there is some interesting stuff going on right now in Iran. Now, I am not an expert on Iran, and I am interested in those of you who do know what's going on there or have a better idea than I am to kind of clue me in of what's going on. Uh, so if you know what's going on in Iran, if you have some of the backstory, definitely get in touch because maybe we should do a little bit of a story on that if we're all still alive next week. But I think that at this point, things are moving fast enough that I personally have been kind of outpaced there. So go to other sources of media for that. But definitely check it out because things are moving pretty quick there. Other than that, the first thing I wanted to go into today was, as you may remember from previous episodes on YouTube, at least, which is, again, why I'm looking for alternatives to YouTube, some of my previous episodes have been censored and have been flagged by the content ID system and have either been flagged so that I can't even uh, fix them and can't uh, make them work at all, or they just get the Creative Commons metadata removed from them, even though they are, in fact, 
Creative Commons, as all of these broadcasts are. They are all free for you to download, free for you to share with your friends, free for you to remix in any way you see fit. But unfortunately, YouTube has a automated system that sees if you are using other people's copyrighted material, which, by the way, is allowed in some cases. You can, if it is a fair use or fair dealing in that material, you can include it legally. Uh, and, of course, the automated system doesn't necessarily know what is fair and what is not, so it is going to just flag you for anything you use, and then you can appeal. However, it used to be the case that you could appeal this automated system, and then there was an appeals process for, to make sure that at least when there's fair use or fair dealing that happened, that there's someone who can approve it. It was a flawed process. I went through it a couple of times. It was a process that put way too much power on the side of the copyright holders, because in some cases, there were copyright holders that did not have a legal standing to restrict the use of the work, and yet the system did restrict the work by default. And then when the appeals process happened, the person you appeal to is the copyright holder. So there's kind of a vested interest in them just blank denying everything. And so I had a couple of appeals denied. I did have actually a couple of them approved as well. I think I got flagged for using Vavrik's work and uh, whoever has the uh, copyright for, at least on YouTube for Vavrik, he was able to approve me. But I got a notice this past week or so saying, quote, ineligible to, for appeal. Your account needs to be verified to be eligible for appeals. So in other words, in order for you to have the right of fair dealing in order for you to have the privilege of fair use in the states you have to give google your phone number which means you have to have a phone which means you in canada probably either have to have a social security number that you're willing to give the phone company or you have to use the prepaid plans which are more expensive and so i find this kind of interesting in that it's an end run around fair use in the united states and it's an end round around fair dealing here in canada because there's really no reason, I mean, this is the reason, I guess, to sign up for a Google account with a phone number and therefore to have a phone and therefore to financially tie yourself to the phone system, even though what you're really using it for is identity, right? So if this is the reason to pay $65 or 20 bucks or whatever it is a month for a cell phone, then that's a huge amount of money for just an identity for something that realistically should be free. The United Nations, I think it's the, uh, either the Declaration of Human Rights or the Rights of the Child, one of the two, but between the two of them, for sure, you have the right to an identity. And if people are requiring of you some kind of special identity above and beyond that, that is actually unnecessary. And we have, over the past century plus, tried to like negotiate ways and forms of making it so that people don't have to pay for that. But that's just sort of something by default you have as a human being that people should understand that, oh, you have an identity. And when you provide the proof of that identity, which should be available for free because that's part of your human right to have an identity that you can get one for without cost. The hair is kind of floppy today. I should probably get a haircut at some point. But anyway, so long story short, and, and then of course, on top of that, the cell phones are surveillance devices right so in order to have identity to be able to use your fair use and fair dealing under the copyright law that is already biased towards copyright holders now you have to agree to surveillance from google which is of course an nsa partner with the prism project so you're as a condition of having fair use, of having the rights that are guaranteed to you in Canadian copyright law, you have to agree to be spied on by the U.S. government, by the Canadian government, etc., as part of uh, the Five Eyes, of course, NSA, and uh, CSIS share all kinds of data. And so you should assume that if Google has data, that they're going to be sharing it with the U.S. and Canadian government. And if your cell phone provider has your location, which your cell phone certainly does, and the software that runs on that cell phone certainly has access to it, and the, your cell phone provider is not going to turn down giving it to uh, CSIS. So you are basically, as part of using your fair use rights, are required to kind of compromise your all kinds of privacy to 
to make use of it. And this is uh, something that I haven't seen anyone actually anyone else comment on, but it's an important change, and it's just like a really subtle one. But when all the other pieces are in place, it's kind of important. So that's going on. But speaking of privacy and having the the right to uh, use other rights like fair use and fair dealing, it's there's an old uh, Sean Kennedy rant, uh, the body armor rant. I'm not going to play the whole rant because uh, some of it's actually, I think, illegal to play in Canada now. I'd have to probably censor that stuff out due to C-51. But there's some of it that's just plain good advice. And that's what it is. So there used to be a poem, long, or I think it was originally a song or a poem, uh, Wear Sunscreen, and he kind of like did an equivalent group of advice to a catchy beat. I think it was Me Beat Manifesto uh, at the time, uh, for the early 2000s. And one of the pieces of advice that he gave was to, and I have it paraphrased here in uh, my post, but it's to acquire guns and fake ID because maybe you won't ever need to use them, but someone you know will. And that was kind of his point. Now, uh, I would kind of add to that a little bit uh, because uh, as someone who's gone through economics, I understand that you are faced with a choice at any given point. Uh, you have to choose between guns or butter, things that are developed to hurt people or to express a force in the world, or butter, a, things that you can enjoy or other people can enjoy. Maybe not everyone enjoys butter. I certainly enjoy butter on my food, and I've made butter. Uh, so I, whenever I am faced with that, obviously I choose butter. I'm not very good with guns, personally. But there's something to be said for both, right? that if you have the choice, if you are given the option that if you acquire these things, if you are ready with butter for when people in your life are interested in eating delicious food, if you can provide butter to them, uh, that is a useful thing. And if you can get to the point in your life where you can consistently have access to butter, that again is also a good thing. And there are a lot of side effects from being able to host a fancy dinner, being able to be the center of your social world, etc. That having access to butter is a useful thing. And obviously it doesn't keep forever. Literally butter doesn't keep forever. But the kind of broader concept of wealth that it implies kind of does last. So in some ways you can kind of save things that are valuable in that sense. But same thing with guns, right? If you are the type of person who you suspect that the world is going to go to shit. In the case of maybe World War III, having a gun wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, right? There are certainly situations where law and order can break down, and then it is a useful thing to have. Now, here in Canada, our access to guns is very restricted, and our access is very... there's paperwork involved, and so you have to be kind of careful with that, in that you don't want to acquire illegal guns, and you don't also want to have the government necessarily know what materials you have in your house. So there's a bit of a trade-off there that every person has to make for themselves. But it is a useful thing to have in the case of some situations. Obviously, in some other situations, it's not a useful thing to have around. I have lived with people who are suicidal and depressed to the point where if there was a gun in the house, I think they probably would have off themselves. And it is conceivable that a gun in the hand of someone in the right frame of mind could lead to them just going postal and killing people. That's, again, another trade-off. But on the same token, there is, I think, an almost certainty that within, if you are listening to this, someone in your life probably will need it. And maybe it's not going to be in Canada. Maybe it's not going to be local to you. But it is a useful thing to have when things really go sideways. And... Right now, if I had the ability to provide a gun to someone in Iran, say, I'm sure they would actually appreciate it, because it very well may come to the point where that is their only means of staying alive. Now, again, that's another thing you have to be very careful of. When you hold up a gun to a U.S. military personnel, they're probably going to shoot you. But on the flip side, if enough people do in Iran, maybe they can be repelled, too. Hard to imagine, but it's conceivable. Anyway, it's something to think about anyway. But the, the, the other important part of this is fake ID, which is, it sounds like a dirty thing. Right? It sounds like, oh, you know, you're, you're bypassing the government. You're creating this possibility for illegal action to occur. 
occur until you start looking at the history of what has happened with governments in the past uh, who have seen fit to restrict people's movement around the countries in which they live with ID and with especially in combination with gun control. Uh, it's worth pointing that out. The history on that is actually fairly clear. There have been a lot of cases in the past where it has become very, very important to escape the place that you currently live. And the only way that you can do this when the government chooses to lock down on where tr free travel in the country where you live is to have the kind of identification that allows for free travel or at least free enough travel to get the hell out of Dodge. There have been people saved in places like Europe, or Northern or I guess Northwestern Europe during the 1930s and 40s, i.e. during the Second World War, especially if you were a Jew in Europe or in parts of Europe, it became really, really important to have access to some kind of identification saying that you were something who you were not. And pe people survived because of it. And people didn't survive, many people, a lot of people <laughs> did not survive because they didn't have such papers. And again, it's in, I guess, a normal sense, in a peaceful country, uh, you don't think that you really need it. You don't really think that, oh, it's never going to happen to me. It can't happen here. The political situation could never degrade to the point where I need to get the hell out of here. And yet, when it does happen, if you're not prepared for it, then you're screwed. There's nothing you can do at that point. And yet, it is something that you can prepare for and the cost, I mean, there is a cost to getting fake ID, especially good fake ID that passes some kind of uh, checks with the, the systems that are in place. But at the same time, it's something that if you have it, it's useful in those situations where your life depends on it. And again, maybe you won't need it. Maybe you are going to live in a country that's at peace uh, for the rest of your life, and that's great. But the people in your life, not all of them are going to have that privilege. And it's worth keeping it around just in case they need it. Especially if it's in a kind of form where it can be used by someone other than you personally. Uh, obviously this is getting harder with time. When uh, Sean recorded this rant, uh, this was before real ID. This was before computerized identification systems, before biometrics became kind of an important part of the system of tracking us as we travel across borders. But there's still cracks in the implementations. There, it's still an imperfect system. There are still ways to fake it. And these ways, it is important for at least somebody to be doing the research of where it works, where it doesn't, so that we can use that research to get around it. And so places like the HOPE Conference and DEF CON, where people are still look, kind of looking into this, yeah, that's an important know. thing to look on. And your life, or at least someone you know, may very well depend on it. So go out there, get your fake ID, and once you have done that, this is something like a ricochet or some other secure means of communication. Don't talk about it on a plain text naked channel. Don't talk about it where you can be heard by your phone or other computing device that is listening to you, but definitely talk about it with the people in your life who you consider to be important, and then maybe me. Uh, so that we can stay informed about what's still possible there. What else is going on in the world? Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about a couple of weeks ago is the idea of super exponential change. Uh, so this is going to be kind of hard because although I have a video here and I can show you like little drawings on a piece of paper, this is a podcast. This is an audio stream. So uh, hopefully we can kind of get this through. But if you've gone through my Yuri China 120 videos, you will know that there is a thing that you can do with numbers that is take the exponential of those numbers. So you can do, for example, two to the third power is two times two times two, which is eight uh, to the fourth power is two times two times two times two, which is 16, et cetera, et cetera. And that you could actually do something like uh, two to the X, where X is just a variable that changes, uh, maybe its a domain is the set of real numbers, and so 2 to the x, if graphed on the set of real numbers, uh, starts very small, so you have at 2 to the 0, you have 1, anything to the 0th power is 1, and then going to the left, so going into negative numbers, uh, it is defined to have 2 to the negative power, all that means is that it's 1 over 2 to the that power. 
So this is should be just a review here. So one, right, two to the negative one is one half. Two to the negative two is one over two times two, which is one quarter, etc. And so as you, if you're kind of plotting this, as you move to the left of the y-axis, you have a smaller and smaller number getting closer and closer to the x-axis. And then the on as you go right, you have a very quickly increasing a curve moving up very quick, uh, going at one to two, at two to four, at three to eight, and so on and so forth. Now, a super exponential function is going to be something of, that looks kind of like two to the two to the x. So it's an exponential within an exponential, or it's an exponential taken to the exponential power. Now this gets very big very quickly. So at zero, two to the two to the x will be two to the one, which is two. One, it's going to be two to the two to the one, which is two to the two, which is four. Two, this is going to be two to the two to the two, which is two to the four, which is two four, sixteen. And these numbers are going to get very big very quickly. Now the reason why I bring this up, and to make sure that you're kind of aware of this. And of course, you, you can do this for numbers other than two, right? You, you get up two to three to the x, three to the three to the x, uh, a million to a million to the x, etc. There's all kinds of numbers you can play with. I just want to get through, though, that there's this idea that you can make exponentials kind of build on themselves in this way, and that there are some things in the universe that you can understand, and when they change, they change super exponentially. And so I just wanted to get that through to the world to, to get, uh, at least to familiarize yourself with this concept. There, I guess that's probably about as deep as I want to get into that. So the next thing I want to talk about is the USMCA, which was agreed to by Canada and the United States a couple of weeks ago. But there's an, it was interesting the way the newspapers covered it, or at least the legacy news media covered it, which seemed to be oh, this is not all that much is changing, this is no big deal, for all the talk online, nothing's really changing, so everyone who's freaking out about it just start being quiet because we shouldn't care that this thing was agreed on, it was a good thing, and it remains a good thing, etc. Of course, anyone who's as old as I am will remember that there used to be a great deal of public outcry on both the left and the right side of the political spectrum, both here in Canada and in the United States, and from the sounds of it in Mexico, and that the majority of the population in all three countries, when these things were announced, when people still kind of thought for themselves <laughs> without being brainwashed, it seems, by things like Facebook, was that the trade deal wasn't a good thing. And it was being rammed down our throat here in Canada by the prime ministers, one after another. The first one basically agreed to it, and then the Liberals got into power promising to get rid of it and then breaking that promise. And then it just went kind of back and forth where everyone knew it was a bad thing, but nobody wanted to be the one that ended it for some reason. It was a very strange era to live through. But the point here is that there are details <laughs> that are in even the changes, not necessarily good things. And when we had the original agreement that was agreed again by the people in the government against the will of the majority of the population of north america then th there's precedent for what just happened uh which is of course we got screwed again so here's the details from i think this is torrent freak quote the united states canada and mexico have signed a new trade deal that will replace nafta the usmca deals with a wide range of trade topics including copyright issues Despite warnings from rights holders and some lawmakers, the agreement offers liability protections for internet companies, including a DMCA-style safe harbor provision. More than a quarter century after the US, Canada, and Mexico approved NAFTA, the North American countries have now signed off on a new trade deal. The new da, 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 will accommodate tra uh, changes in trade that the three countries have witnessed over the years, especially online. The road wasn't uh, without obstacles, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't just cover copyright issues. Um, but the previously agreed text certainly does, or sorry, the amendments don't co cover copyright issues, but the previously agreed text certainly does. So in other words, what the, the news tried to like 
get across was that the the latest changes to the deal, the latest things that were being argued over, those weren't copyright because both the government of Canada and the government of the United States both already agree that uh, stricter copyright rules are what is called for. They're both in the pockets of things like the RIAA and here in Canada, Music Canada, but they don't know how to sell this to the public who will have to live with the restrictions on the technology in their life, will have to live with the threat of getting sued, will have to live with a worse culture, a more locked down culture even to the extent that people understand that. So, quote, for example, the US MCA will require all countries to have a copyright term that continues for at least 70 years after the creator's death. Now, there was some discussion, I think, on my, Michael Geist's blog that the way that they worded that did allow for some wiggle room in that we could, for example, go back to the way things were in the 1970s across the world where you could have, or, or at least outside of Canada across the world, where you could have copyright up to a certain amount, but you had to register it. And so there was some degree of paperwork involved in maintaining your right to prevent others from copying your work. We could do that. That is something that Canada could choose to do. We're, of course, not going to. We have a copyright maximalist government, even if it is a minority government. And then in addition to that, the Conservatives are also more or less copyright maximalists. So uh, the copyright maximalists have a plurality in our parliament right now. And so there's no reason to expect little compromises like that could happen or, or will happen, but they could. And so, but that's that's something that's coming down the pipe now. It hasn't been ratified yet, but it's we should expect a new copyright bill on the horizon uh, to ratify it. And that, that is going to be an important thing because right now we do have this 20 year gap from 50 to 70 where we could, for example, have things in the public domain in Canada from people who have died and now 1960. Uh, so that's going to include people like the Big Bopper. It's going to include people, uh, all kinds of authors that are currently, as of uh, a couple of days ago at least, in Project Gutenberg Canada's archive of old Canadian books uh, that you can read to kind of get a, a deeper understanding of Canadian culture that goes back to 1950 uh, and before. And there's all kinds of things that happen in the years from 19. 40 through 1960 that are worth remembering, right? And yet, this is going to restrict us from copying, restrict us from remaking them, restrict us from uh, taking those old works and breathing new life into them and keeping our culture at a stagnant level where we can't re or build on top of that stuff. Uh, so uh, that is one of the things we just lost. Uh, this won't happen instantly as the country negotiated a transition period to consult with the public on how to best meet this requirement. Of course, here in Canada, that consultation, we had a consultation on that, and there was thousands and thousands of responses, some of which were very well thought through about this issue, and the government just deleted the whole kit and caboodle. And so they want to start from scratch because the responses were pro-user. They were pro-Canadian culture. They were pro-freedom in many ways. And so there's all kinds of arguments made. And now we're going to have to repeat all these same arguments and, all these thousand, and mobilize those thousands of people to do the same thing a second or third time over the past like decade or two. And they're just going to keep trying these consultations until they get what they want, similar to the ERRE consultations, where they did the consultation the Liberal government, then they decided that the output of the consultation wasn't what they wanted, and so they scrapped it and ignored the output. And that's what they're going to do in this case as well. So another controversial subject was widely debated by experts and stakeholders is the DMCA-style safe harbor tax. In the U.S., ISPs are shielded from copyright infringement liability under the safe harbor provisions of the DMCA, and the New Deal would expand the security to Mexico and Canada. Uh, this expansion was welcomed by many large technology companies, including internet providers and hosting platforms. However, many major industry, blah, 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 uh, they were not. The it, RIA was in place, long story short. Now, it's, it's worth pointing out that this isn't the only thing from the DMCA that the MCA or USMCA is going to incorporate. Incorporating the DMCA uh, laws or more of the DMCA into North American law means that we can't, as a country, decide to back out of, for example, the WIPO Copyright Treaty and start undoing the damage of the Copyright Modernization Act. It's going to work. In order to do that, we'd have to leave now NAFTA or the equivalent of NAFTA and re completely renegotiate all of our trade with the states. 
the, this is a huge barrier to changing copyright law in Canada now. It is a huge barrier. And yes, we get the, this little crumb of having the ISPs at least have some uh, liability protection, but the way that they get that liability protection is by, for example, uh, doing what they're doing right now, which is throwing the user under the bus. And so it's when our laws become coupled to, or our copyright law becomes coupled to our trade law, it means that our ability to have food on the table is now going to depend on whether or not we maintain the same rules in copyright law. This is now way beyond the, the moral rights of the author here in Canada. Uh, when we start having the next level of arguments about the next level of uh, copyright change, we have to keep in mind that it's definitely not about the artist anymore. It's, it's so far beyond the individual artist. It's not even about the, the big corporations who have the copyrights anymore. This is now purely about whether or not the U.S. government and the, the U.S. empire can exploit Canada. <laughs> that is what copyright law has boiled down to at this point. Because if we make changes, then, again, the whole of our trading with the states and having a border where people can pass through is now up for, not debate, I guess, but the it, it is at risk, right? We now risk all of that merely for having the right to have things like fair dealing without automated systems restricting our ability to have them. Right. Quote, the safe harbors for copyright infringement and takedown requirements don't apply to Canada as long as it continues to rely on its current notice and notice scheme, which, as you may have heard in one of my previous episodes, is already breaking down. And the thin line between copyright holders and the users who use things like BitTorrent uh, to share their works is breaking down. And people are starting to get the lawsuits uh, landing in their lap again. So. Michael Geist considers a safe harbor and objectionable content is a win for freedom of expression. And so that, that may be the case that we get a little, again, a little bit of crumb here about the ISPs being protected uh, and other content providers about objectionable content. But the cost is going to be the extra 20 years of copyright, coupling our country's copyright law to the interests of trade and to the uh, U- what the U.S. wants as part of that. And so even though the MPA and the RIA are not happy, and that's always a good sign when that, that is the case, it's just way too dangerous to have agreed to this. And Justin Trudeau has sold us out as a country because he has agreed to this agreement and locked us in for who knows how long because of it. So, But we did have an election over this. This was an election issue. The Conservatives were very explicit in their support of having a trade agreement like this. And so, and, and of course, the, the, the Liberals have a long track record of, of not getting rid of, or at least uh, tacitly approving of these kinds of restrictive agreements. So again, there's a plurality of seats in the parliament that allowed for this to happen and for this to be ratified when it goes to a, a vote. And so we are definitely going to be suffering because of the outcome of the last election, because this sort of thing becomes possible. So while that's going on, there is a still a movement in the states to save net neutrality. There has been a series of lawsuits going on that have been particularly challenging the Trump administration's ability to withhold net neutrality. But according to oh yeah, Fight for the Future, which is a kind of internet protest group that uh, is continually hammering on issues like net neutrality, but they have a link to something saying, quote, net neutrality ruling, states can set their own rules. Quote, a federal court upholds the FCC's repeal of Obama era rules, but slams the agency for preempting state net neutrality laws. So since the ruling, there have been, the fight basically went into the states. And that's one thing about the way that the United States is kind of designed at the government level, that there is a little bit of autonomy in the states as far as these kinds of laws are concerned. And so immediately after the appeal, the telcos and the big network companies like Comcast and Verizon went to start passing anti-net neutrality laws in the states. And groups like Fight for the Future immediately went on the offensive and started lobbying for for pro-net neutrality laws in each of the states in the United States. And so now it's like a state-by-state battle. And some states are going to go to the net neutrality side, some states are not. Key states are going to be things like California. I think California did keep theirs. And New York uh, is going to be another key state to watch. 
again, there's a lot of moving pieces, but Fight for the Future at least is going to try to keep the, the United States and, and the rest of the world informed on this. And so they've got a link here basically saying that they need your donations to make this happen. Uh, I am not personally going to donate this time. It, it does seem to be like a local fight rather than a, a global one at this point. I mean, I, if Idaho keeps their net neutrality, that's, that's great. But uh, it's, it's not, again, it's just something that I'm not personally going to be engaged in. But it's something to, worth knowing about, right? Maybe, maybe you know someone in some state where they're having the battle. And uh, this particular link that I'm going to share is worth sending to them. Speaking of which, I should actually probably post links on Facebook threads rather than just on YouTube. I've been just posting on YouTube for the past little while, and uh, I think I'm going to start to change that so you guys can see more of what I'm talking about. So, there's that. Let's see what else is going on. There's a rumor on the Fediverse from one cat goes woof. Uh, quote, it seems that Birdsight, i.e. Twitter, will ban BDSM, or anything that implies lack of consent, hentai, included porn in 2020. Brace yourselves for impact. We'll be seeing a lot of lewd new friends in the near future. Every time large social media platforms shit themselves, the Fedi, the Fediverse grows stronger. Now, I haven't heard anyone else mention this. This is the only place that I've kind of heard this, so take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. But this is part of a movement, a larger movement in on Twitter to basically restrict what people can talk about, similar to what Reddit did maybe about mm, five years ago, six years ago, where certain subjects became just auto-censored or automatically uh, would get you a shadow ban, and gradually they changed it into what I kind of consider to be a sandbox, and safe for children to play around in, but not really safe for adults to have conversations and to uh, enjoy their the sexual aspects of their life in whatever way that they kind of see fit to do so as adults and as, again, consenting adults. Now, in this case, there's this kind of line there of the, the breaking of consent. Now, it's a squicky thing for me personally. I'm not really into the whole rape fantasy thing, not my cup of tea, but there are people who are into that sort of thing. And there is a line between uh, fantasy and reality and sharing, for example, you know, women being raped at parties, that sort of thing. Uh, that is it, documentation of an illegal act. And that is the sort of thing that it is worth considering having kind of restrictions on. However, this blanket ban is going to cover a lot more than that. Uh, you can pretty much guarantee that. So, uh, and it's not necessarily treated as a, it's going to be kind of like the, the documentation of war crimes thing in the case of Dalai al-Islamia, where Google and Twitter and a whole bunch of companies basically banned all this stuff that uh, these videos that Dawa al-Islamiyah was posting, and it turned out that their doing so made it really hard to prosecute them for afterwards, because the evidence that they ever did these things was wiped from the internet. And so when the war crimes tribunal started to do their research, they realized that their case was a lot weaker than it should have been because of this. And we're going to see the same thing happen in this case with Twitter, where there is going to be rapists who are probably going to get off because of this. And they're is a side effect to just blanket banning this stuff. But at the same token, it's also part and parcel of what we just saw with uh, Sesto and Fosta, where there's just like a criminalization of sexual activity on the internet going on. It's slow. It, there's obviously still plenty of sexual things uh, on the internet, but the there are Puritans out there, and there are people who want to control whether or not people other people have access to sexual things in their life, and this is just one of those steps in that direction. And so it's something to watch for as we kind of go into the new year. The last thing that I wanted to bring up is, and I did post this one to Facebook, is a less wrong post from 2007 called Politics is the Mind Killer. And the long story short, as we are kind of running out of time here, is that when people start talking about politics, it becomes very heated very quickly. And you wind up getting a lot of the time more heat than a uh, signal, more stat more noise than signal, more people just angry at each other. You get you bring out the divisions of people or between people. This is something you'll see really cl clearly 
in the case of when people start going into the direction of intersectional uh, feminism and intersectionality generally, is the differences between people get highlighted. And so it's easier to see them and it's easier to disagree and or get into conflicts about these disagreements. Uh, so politics as a general thing gets very hard to, to deal with in a rational level, hard to deal with at a peaceful level, hard to deal with in a conversation level. A lot of people don't even want to talk about it especially in eras like the current one we're living in and since about 2016, especially around the time of the 2016 election, people just got sick of talking and thinking about politics. The U.S. election is really bad for this, given the, the amount of commercials, uh, especially on television, where you just like get banged over the head about this side is doing this thing, the other side is doing the other thing. But the point here, though, is that there is a space in the world for politics. If we completely ignore politics, and if we just try to keep all of our discussions about politics from happening, their powerful entities will take advantage of us. And the groups that uh, have a degree of unfair control over the world uh, will continue to have that. And we will not change many of the things that are wrong with the world. So there has to be a place for political discussion, even if maybe certain spaces and certain contexts, it's better to kind of keep the politics to a minimum. This show this particular broadcast is a political broadcast. I am expecting to get people riled up on it, and I'm expecting to get people to get into conflict over it. Uh, it is not something that we want to keep as a kind of neutral point of view thing. I do try to be uh, not necessarily neutral, but kind of give every side a fair shake. But if you have a political idea that you want to get across or you want other people to like take seriously, maybe, definitely get in touch, and maybe we'll have you on this show because that's the direction I want to go with it. So that is the, the end of the show for today. Uh, as usual, if you want to see people getting upset at each other over politics, perhaps, uh, or just more of this kind of broadcast, uh, maybe more interesting broadcasts. Oh, actually, I forgot the music. Ooh. Maybe I'll just end with the music this time instead of the goodbye song. I have two songs that I'm going to play and then hopefully you'll enjoy at the end here. But if you do enjoy this broadcast, definitely give me or give a click to my subscriber star at subscriberstar.com slash jeff-cliff. And with that, hopefully we'll see you next week and enjoy the two songs. The first one is, I, I was talking about Kevin McLeod earlier. We played one of his songs a couple shows ago. This is the, the song of his that I know about. And then after that, uh, actually one of the old Sean Kennedy rants uh, put together by Tenchi uh, from the Prophecy of a Dark Angel album, New Hope. So... We'll see you all next week.
it's so hard to be alone. We sit in crowds, in the darkness of crowds. We seek solitude and weep when we find it. Information is being brought to us so fast. Information comes through the air. Information comes through the wires. And all the information just makes us grow darker. Children are starving while nations grow fat. Animals scream in feedlots. Chickens are boiled alive. I just wanted to have lunch. I didn't want to be a murderer. I just wanted to get some shoes. I wasn't making a political statement. I dyed my hair black. I got steel going through my face. But I still got work. I still have to deal with people. Because they were a tie, they think they're better than I am. I sit in front of the wire. And I broadcast everything I can. I've learned how to smoke back. I've learned how to rewire so that I can use the box. It's so hard to be alone. It's so hard to keep the fight up. It's so hard to walk through the falling trees. It's so hard to walk through the sarcasm and the hate that falls like rain from the dark skies. It's so hard to walk past that homeless man. steps away from where he is, but one day, one day, we won't have to be alone, one day, we can all band together, and we can try to make something better, we can try to stand together for something. All these wires, all these airways, that people are connected, they don't see each other in subways, in elevators, on the street, in their cars. No one sees me. So, actually, there's a little bit of breaking news while I was listening to that song uh, by one of the people I used to, I think she even may have used to follow me on Google+, Plus, which is, or at least I was following her, and I think she followed me back at one point. But anyway, Erica Joy, quote, uh, Law Twitter, if you look at my profile, you might, might notice a tweet has been removed for, quote, violating the Twitter rules. The tweet, a no war on Iran image. Their automated filtering has gotten borked in such a way that re or that tweeting th that image will result in an Insta account block. And then it shows the picture. It's just a black uh, background, white text, no war on Iran image. So I'm going to try an experiment here and actually create such an image myself and upload it to my Twitter account. And then so far, so good. Of course, this isn't my account. I personally have been banned off of Twitter, but I do have access to a couple of accounts that I can test this on. So we're going to see very whether or not the uh, 
I, I'm just going to see if... Okay, so she's got a source for the original image, so we don't even have to make our own. So we just save, and we're going to try posting this downloaded picture, because there are other reports of it being suspended too. So let's see. Okay, so, quote, this indeed was a bug that inc incorrectly captured the image you posted as a false positive match meant to address other nefarious and policy violating activity. It's now fixed, so similar tweets referencing that image shouldn't be caught. Very sorry for the inconvenience. Now, that is awfully convenient for Twitter. Again, Twitter being owned by uh, Saudi interests. So that's on the Sunni side of the Sunni Shia divide in the Middle East. So they have an interest in their main or one of their enemies the government of iran being taken out by the u.s government so when for example gargron the guy who created the mastodon software that is kind of the flagship software of the fediverse quote uh, interesting twitter is automatically suspending accounts that tweet an image consisting of a black background with white text no war on around on it quote this was an auto lock twitter wants us to go to war which again it's plausible you can either believe twitter's side of this that it was an uh, honest mistake, or you can realize that they have very, every interest in promoting this war. And I've seen a lot of memes and pictures on Twitter uh, and coming from Twitter uh, that are definitely, definitely tilting, tilting us in that, that direction, direction uh, or tilting the world in that direction, direction, and especially the U.S. public in the direction of war. The war drums are being beaten, and they're being beaten by groups well, like Twitter. Uh, so something to keep an eye on and to, to watch your social media platforms to see if censorship of anti-war messages is occurring and if you do see it definitely help run around that damage and make sure those voices are heard maybe we can prevent the world from going to war so again we'll see you next week